be doing the neural interface uh, for short and I. We're composed of Louise, Gordon, Michael, Ozil, Martina, and Sarkisdeno. So neural interfaces, uh, I'm analyze as they exist to compensate for lost neural uh, activity and the ability to, uh, to transport signals from the brain to the rest of the body and vice versa. And it's a connection that enables a two-way exchange of information with the nervous system. Um, and it's, uh, it's, due, it's due to the yeah. possibility to skip. Oh yeah, yeah. It's, 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 uh, it's possible due to the ability of the brain to adapt and uh, accept signals from implanted prosthetics such as the natural sensors and the effector channels. And uh, with that, there are two main types of the NI. The first one is the DCI, which is the brain to computer interface, and, and it extracts, ex extracts information from the brain <laughs> to a computer outside there, and it controls a machine or a, or a robot outside of the body. And the second type is the neuroprosthetics, where uh, it's a connection between the, the nervous system and a device that's implanted on the body, and it usually uses the, an interface with the peripheral nervous system to make that connection. There's a picture of, of the nervous system, uh, the brain, in the head, and the rest of the network is the peripheral nervous system. So there are um, three main types of uh, PMIs. The first is an invasive type, um, where surgery is required. Uh, where surgery is required into the uh, brain, and they actually insert electrodes or probes into your brain. Um, as you can imagine, that's not very safe um, and requires a lot of work. But it's how you get the strongest signals with uh, minimal interference. Um, non uh, it's also called intracortical neural interface, I and I. Um, Non-invasive, um, there's no surgery, the electrodes are on the scalp of the brain usually. Um, it's the weakest signals with uh, lots of interference but requires absolutely no surgery. Um, Semi-invasive usually has sensors implanted on the surface of the brain, so surgery into your skull is still required, but you're not actually going into the brain. Um, it's called, also called an extracortical, so outside the brain, neural interface, ENI. And its signal strength and interference is between the two levels of invasive and uh, non-invasive. Um, BMIs can receive a large variety of signals, um, since your brain is really the control center for everything. And it can be difficult to determine what each of the signals mean. Um, it can be used to bypass spinal cord injury because um, if you have a spinal cord injury, there are no nerve impulses reaching to the rest of your body. And you cannot use your peripheral nervous system to get the signals. And it can also be used to control external machines like um, uh, the video that Dr. Park showed us of the woman moving the mouse. Um, Neuroprosthetics um, includes prosthetic legs. Um, it usually requires surgery to insert the electrodes into your arms where the peripheral nervous systems are. Um, it's usually easier to isolate signals since the signals are concentrated and there's like only like one set of purpose for each nerve signal. Um, and as I said before, it cannot be used in all cases like paralysis. Um, there's often overlap between neural prosthetics and BMI since a lot of the main purpose is to um, restore lost bodily function like sight or movement. So they are sometimes used interchangeably. Um, a brief history of two um, Interfaces, one I'm focusing on is EEGs. In 1875, Richard Catton was the first discoverer of EEGs, and he inserted, um, he actually inserted probes in directly into monkey and rabbit brains. Um, Hans Berger recorded human brain activity, but he had um, electrodes right directly on the brain, so an extracortical um, nervous interface. 
1938, uh, Alfred Lee Loomis created the first device to record EEGs for long periods of time to record sleep patterns. And currently, we're using computers and much more sensitive electrodes that do not require any sort of surgery. Um, 1969, implanted an electrode array to provide a degree of sight. Um, this is a form of uh, neuroprosthetic. Dr. Willem Dabal and his team planned the first uh, portable visual processes, and current work is allowing for smaller sensor arrays to allow more complex images. Um, so how a neuroprosthetic limb works? Electrodes are implanted into individuals where the peripheral nervous systems are. Um, electrodes are stimulated by asking the person to move a certain part of their body, like your fingers or bending the arm. The nerve impulse is then recorded by the computer and can then be later re recalled when the same impulse is received again. Uh, so now, this is a case that we worked on. Uh, as you can see, there's a test subject. He has an amputee uh, above his forearm or above his elbow. Uh, he's connected. We can't, really see, we can't see the electrodes because they're implanted. We connected by uh, a wire. Uh, this type of interface software, and then essentially a uh, prosthetic arm and the laptop computer. Okay. So the purpose of this uh, research um, was to create a, a more advanced prosthetic arm um, to provide more uh, sensory feedback for position and pressure. Position being the uh, degree at which the angle or fingers are um, removed. Uh, pressure being how much the person can sense or um, uh, grip the fingers. And in this particular experiment, they use a longitudinal and intravascular electrodes called LIPES, um, as well as a saddle connector, a computer, as you guys saw, and uh, of course, the prosthetic, prosthetic arm. So this shows uh, the intensity uh, of the light in the median nerve. And this, is, this shows uh, what they actually did. So the electrodes, there are about six to eight electrodes uh, implanted in the median, median nerve. Um, this is the, the saddle connector. And you know, it's able to connect to the, uh, to the computer. So essentially what the experiment did. So for the sensory input, they obtained a stimulating nerve by uh, sending different signals and at different uh, frequencies. Uh, they recorded what the, what the test subject saw or felt. Um, for motor control, the subject was asked to make uh, certain movements in the hand or in the wrist or the elbow. Uh, so results, so the test subjects were able to actually interpret um, pressure sensors so they were, uh, they were actually able to sense or give a, a certain pressure. Um, you're also able to sense that the movement, like I said, the movement of the at which the elbow was bent, uh, as well as the fingers. They were also uh, able to apply different forces on hand. Uh, they used 22, 44, and 67 newtons of force, and they were also able to bend the arm at varying degrees. All right, so I uh, just want to talk a little bit about the applications, although um, the main, you know, there is some, some application in the present. Most of uh, most of the uh, most of the work is done for research and to further uh, develop these these uh, devices. Um, the key applications at the moment, or what we are aiming to, is uh, is to restore movement for people with motor disabilities, or to have an interface with uh, the computer to uh, you know, and that can be processed, and, and, and we can have an input um, for it. Uh, so here we see uh, uh, electroencephalography. And then this is a this is a this is a device that will measure different electrical impulses throughout uh, the brain without being invasive, so they can just be hooked on. So this is this is pretty good, but um, like we already discussed, there's always noise, so it's not as, as accurate as um, as as we you know as we wanted to at, at this time. But there are some improvements you can see. Um, some 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 uh, this 
this is a, a camera that's actually plugged into into this the, the guy's uh, brain. You know, they actually that's this invasive, um, but it actually generates a pretty pretty image, pretty good image. I mean, I mean, they can't really tell different colors or, or things like that, but it's pretty good where they can actually see um, you know far uh, the distant depth and things like that. Um, and uh, these are just more examples. Um, and so I already mentioned um, some of these. They, some, you know, some people would uh, like this one, gaming. And then, um, yeah, this is another picture. So. All right, so what do we need for to have a brain neural interface? <laughs> brain computer interface, I'm sorry. That confused me. <laughs> Um, so we need a neural interface. What does this mean? It means it pretty much has to get um, some kind of signal from the brain, because if you're not going to get a signal at all, then you have nothing to, <laughs> to get put into the computer. The decoder interface is what actually communicates or translates, like from Spanish to English, where like your brain signals are electrical impulses or Spanish, and English is your computer understanding of it. All right, user interface is just what makes um, controlling the system easy, like a software. For example, a computer mouse is a user interface for us, because we can move it. But it's not a useful in, um, interface for people, for example, who are um, tetraplegic. One, two, three, four, like it doesn't work, you know. Okay, um, so this is a rough schematic of VCI components. Um, his head's chopped off, but it has electrodes attached to it. Then it goes through an amplifier, which amplifies the signal. Huh? and also um, conditions it by various uh, filters. And the reason we want this is because your brain, because um, brain computer interfaces, the better ones are the ones that are actually invasive and actually connected to your brain. Meaning that they're getting the most signals that's from different um, dendrites, neurons. And so you only have to get like a, the bigger ones because what we're trying to do here is to have a your, your brain's thinking already, right? You're already sending signals, else you'd be deaf because you wouldn't be breathing and doing other things like that. But what happens is that you want to think of, like, for example, I can't move my arm anymore because I'm tetraplegic, but now I think of that, and since the connection is there, they can take advantage of those pathways to make something happen. So it's only going to be voluntary movements or thoughts of movement. All right, so it goes to that, and then it, and, um, it further <coughs> translated relates it to something the computer can understand as an as a actual signal or command. And so then that goes to the, wait, uh, okay, so it kings it, translates it, then it goes to the computer interface for the user to be able to <coughs> comprehend the computer, and then it goes to the device. And the device can function, for example, like moving, um, <coughs> Wheelchair. Yeah. Wheelchair. <laughs> but there's also like new technology advances for uh, with, like for example shifting gears on a bicycle. So <laughs> bikers, even though they're not tetraplegic, they can do it by uh, just thinking of I oh, want to switch to another gear. So, um, so you have signal processing, which is um, actually an acquisition of the signal. Um, extraction, which means like a conditioning here, getting all these relevant signals, translation, making it go to the computer, computer interface, meaning going to the program. Program going to device, I mean, to the device controller and the device. Um, experimentation. Also, this was just the experiment, and this is, for example, what would you plug in onto your head? And so these are just the, the statistics of it. Um, okay. uh, the results of that were the actual conditions were able to be recorded, immediate modulation of cortex neurons for possible. This just means that you can move your arm, but your brain still can, is able to send signal. Um, all right, so I'll talk about what's possible in the future with ECI. Medical applications can be applied to brain diseases. Such diseases such as Alzheimer's or dementia are quite crippling. They cause a loss of memories of cherished moments and inability to recognize family or loved ones. So in order to fix this, we can hook people up to ECI and provide stimulus that can delay the onset or possibly even prevent Alzheimer's dementia. 
All right, so let's go a little bit beyond the scope of medical applications. Let's talk about recent breakthroughs, such as um, UC Berkeley and Japan have found out that they can actually use BCIs in a non-invasive way to recreate images from someone's brain. So they showed someone, for instance, a YouTube video, and then they were able to piece together second by second what the video was. Um, the US Army has found that it's possible to take uh, electrophotograph signals to discriminate between the vowels and consonants of speech. In other words, they can find out what someone's thinking and then translate that speech sometime in the future. This, they say that they want to use this for you know, brain-dead communication. Sounds more like they want to use it for interrogation purposes. <laughs> <laughs> now let's look at some even further potentials. Now this, we kind of go into a realm of speculation, but isn't that what engineering is all about? So we can even take brain-generated signals to another brain, what they and what if we reverse the pathway? Now, BCIs, we kind of take signals from the brain, and then we kind of translate that into something we can understand. What if we did it the other way around, where we take the signals, and then we translate it into electrical activity that influences the brain? In other words, we could theoretically mind control someone, but whatever. No. <laughs> we can also take the imaging technology, and we can possibly even view or record dreams. So if we take all this and put it together, isn't it possible that we could have something like this. <laughs> and so for our concluding note, we are all bioengineers and we are in one of the greatest industries in the world. So I want you all to dedicate your lives. <laughs> <laughs>